Good afternoon and happy new year and welcome to the Douglas County Racial and Ethnic Disparities, also known as Red Virtual Conference. My name is LaDonna Jones Dunlap and I am one of the co-chairs of the Racial and Ethnic Disparities Subcommittee. I'd like to give a special thank you to the Separate Juvenile Court of Douglas County, Nebraska, the Honorable Vernon Daniels, CEO and President of the Urban League of Nebraska, Mr. Thomas Warren Sr., and Douglas County Commissioner Chris Rogers. These individuals provide unwavering support for our RED efforts and make our work possible. An additional thank you to the Nebraska Juvenile Justice Association Partnership for making this virtual platform possible. A few housekeeping items before we get started. All participants have been placed on mute. If you have a question for our presenters, please enter it into the chat box. We will monitor questions as they come in and get to as many as time permits after the presentation. For purposes of CEUs, if you are reviewing uh, this presentation in a room with others, please make sure to type your name and email address into the chat box to receive your certification. Certificates will be emailed out this week. Um, I believe we have a survey that will pop up here shortly so we can see who is in the room before we get started. As always, the Red Committee um, like to see who's joining us today and definitely appreciate you taking the time to join us over this noon hour. So if you would please take a moment to let us know what agency you are with, that would be great. As a reminder, at the end of this presentation, during the closing remarks, we will put up a survey asking you a few questions about the presentation. Your input is valuable to us and we thank you in advance for completing it. Our presenters today are from the Latino Center of the Midlands and their topic for today's session is impacting behavior through culture. And I will let them introduce themselves. Thank you. Hi, LaDonna, thank you. Um, my name is Carmen Chagoya. I'm the Senior Program Manager for the Pathways to Success Program and I'll hand it over to my colleagues here. Hello, my name is Mayra Hernandez, and I am the student advocate at Bryan High School. Go Bears! And um, Circulus Facilitator. And uh, my name is Mahatma Larga Espada. I'm the Circulus Supervisor here at the Latino Center of the Midlands. Okay. And I'll actually take my mask off, and um, as we're talking to you all, please feel free to ask any questions, drop them in the box, um, and then we'll answer them as we go on with our presentation. And, um, um, are you guys able to see the presentation? Yeah. Actually, is that a yes? Okay. There we go. Okay. Are you guys able to see our screen? Yes, we can. Yes. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So today, uh, for today's presentation, we'll be sharing with you about our work that we do uh, in our Pathways to Success program. Um, so we'll go more in depth in that later on, but we would love to share with you about all of the services that we provide here at the Latino Center of the Midlands. Um, some of you may know our organization as a Chicano Awareness Center. Um, that's the name that we were officially, um, when we were first started, or when we first started in 1971, we started as a Chicano Awareness Center. And so um, our services have evolved, our community has diversified, and so did our name. And so we've been known as the Latino Center of the Midlands. One of the services and one of the things that we have kept consistent is the services around advocacy and education to our community. We are currently providing services in three departments. And so that includes our family community well-being department, our workforce education and innovation, and our pathways to success program. So I'll share with you more about two of the programs and then I'll hand it off to Myra and Mahatma so that they can go more in depth in our um, P2S or pathways to success program. 
So our Family, Community, and Wellbeing Department focuses on working with different experts to provide services and tools for families in order for them to live a healthier life. And they do so through three pieces um, or three programming areas that focus on health and well-being, social integration, and financial well-being. Through their health and well-being programming, they focus on providing workshops around mental and physical health to families. Um, they have a program that's called Siembra Salud or Grow Wellness, where they work with different um, clients. They go to their homes and they have in-home services where the clients learn how to grow their own vegetables and fruits. If they live in an apartment or if they don't have a place where they can have their own home garden, they do partner up with CD Sprouts here in South Omaha and they're able to use some of their gardening beds on site. Um, so once they get their vegetables and everything is done and they have it at their table, the clients actually learn how to cook and bake and make healthier meals in order for them to um, be healthier. They also have programming for kids. They have a um, healthy kids club where um, children learn about physical activities and about nutrition so that again, they can grow to be healthier. Um, in the social integration piece of their programming, they actually work with clients so that they can advocate for them and the clients learn how to navigate through different social institutions. This is one of the pieces of their programming where they provide the one-on-one -on -one services. They can be done through walk-ins or through appointments, um, pretty much anything and everything that the community needs. This is the piece of programming where they provide some of those services that may include if they need to to make a phone call, if they need a letter to be translated. Um, we work with different lawyers and they come here and they provide um, immigration, free immigration consultation. So um, not only that, but also our clients are able to receive resources um, to pantry or whatever need that they may have. This is where they come and they are helped. Um, they also have workshops around civic engagement where clients learn um, about voting, when to vote, how to vote, how to register. Um, now for physical, for the financial well-being piece of their programming, um, they teach and they have workshops for clients around banking. And right now it's tax season. So we actually prepare, have free tax preparation for clients here at the Latino Center of the Midlands. So if you're working with anybody that uh, needs um, or has the need of having their taxes prepared for free, have them call our center so they can make an appointment. Um, so that's a little bit about our family, community, and well-being department. Now for our workforce education and innovation department, um, they provide services around adult basic education. So we provide, the classes that we're providing right now are English as a second language, literacy classes for the clients that don't know how to read and write. They come here and they can learn how to read and write. They can enroll then in pre-GED classes and GED classes. It's pretty neat because clients can come in here not knowing how to read and write and they've really take advantage of the programming around the adult basic education. They can leave here with their GED diploma. Um, some of you may be aware that the testing sites for GED have been closed, but here at the Latino Center, we've actually been blessed to be able to provide and proctor those GED testings here uh, for the students that take part on the GED classes. Um, so they're able to test on site as well. Just so you know, most of the services that we provide here at the Latino Center are free, except for adult basic education um, classes. There is a small fee of $10. It's very manageable, very doable, um, but no, if any student is not able to come up with the $10 for the month, we're, we're able um, to work with them. We don't turn anybody down um, or turn anybody away. Um, so we work with them in order for them to, you know, come up with a payment plan or whatever they may need. Um, once they enroll in the classes, we provide all the um, um, notebooks, all the notes, everything that they need in order for them to be successful and don't have to worry about anything else. In addition to the classes that I mentioned, there's also computer classes and citizenship classes here at the Latino Center. For, their, uh, for the workforce piece of this department, um, there are different workshops where the students can take part on around um, 
knowledge and skills, how to improve um, their knowledge and skills about their jobs, um, whether it is to improve their current job or so that they can better their um, opportunities for employment. And so some of the workshop sessions that they go over include um, job application, what an interview should look like, um, how to write their resume. And one of the coolest things is that they actually go over what an onboarding process should look like so that they can be ready and they can be confident as they start a new job. Um, the, one of the initiatives that this program began, or this department, excuse me, um, just began this past summer was the internship um, opportunities that we provided through our Siembra Nebraska, which is our agriculture internship and our media internship. So um, youth in high school and in college had the opportunity to work, not only uh, get paid for it, but also had an opportunity to give back to the community. So in the agriculture internship, they not only learned about um, the urban agriculture systems, but they also uh, had an opportunity to give back to the community all the produce that most of the produce that they actually worked on, they gave back to the community and the media internship. They worked with our communications team here at the Latino Center. Uh, so if you check out our different social media platforms, as well as our website, you will be able to see some of the work that they actually um, did over the last summer and part of the fall. Again, we wanted to share with you information on our family and community well-being and our workforce um, education and innovation departments because it is very important for us not only to bring you um, some of that information, but because when we work with our Pathways to Success programs, families, and youth, we use our internal resources in order for us to provide that wraparound services um, to our families. So... Are there any questions right now? I know, Deb, you were helping us with the questions. Uh, no questions in the chat yet. Okay. Well, thank you. If you feel like you have any questions, please drop them in there. We'll have um, time at the end, but also through our presentation. Even though we can't see your face, we still want to make this um, as comfortable as if we were all in the same room. Um, now I'll hand it over to both Myra and Mahatma. Um, our Pathways to Success program is divided into two pieces. One is our school-based attendance program, and the other one is our cultural leadership piece, uh, which is our Circulos program. Okay, thank you for that, Carmen. Um, yes, the Pathways to Success program, it is divided between our attendance piece and our um, Circulos. Um, so I am actually going to be talking about... Um, our attendance piece. We do, um, we, we are actually based within seven different schools, um, but even though we're at seven different schools, we are a big family. <laughs> All our students from different schools, each advocate um, treats them the same. Um, recently during the COVID, they've been actually coming here, whoever, um, whoever, well, majority of like OPS students will be coming into the center. Um, some days when Bellevue um, or Ralston don't have classes, they come here to the center also, and we help them with homework and assignments. Um, but what I would like to mention is our, our attendance piece overall is based actually at school. We are always located within the school. Um, we can say around 75% we would be at a school and then 25% within our center, helping out our community. Um, we are year round and, and the reason why we're year round, cause we're not only just within the school, this, the, when school is available, we're, uh, we're available during the summer because a lot of our kids get disconnected. So we decide to do programming during the, um, the summer. We do use a check and connect model, which is an evidence-based, um, which is an evidence-based curriculum. Um, in the majority of all the children that we work with are what we would say a tier two. Tier two meaning that they're students from, you know, from 10 to 15 days of missed school. But the reason why we work with them is because they're still, you know, in that gap of, yes, we're going to school, um, but they have missed days. And that's why we, as an advocate, um, we ask, you know, how are we engaging these kids? How are we motivating them, motivating them to continue coming to school? Um, and it's hard. We're not going to lie. You know, but at the first, at first, it's more of that trust, you know, building, um, 
building that trust, you know, making sure that they believe you're going to be there, that you're not just another person on a caseload. Because unfortunately, a lot of kids already are going through that. They're just like, oh, yeah, I'm just on your list. I'm going to pass a couple of months and you're going to forget about me. And no, our program isn't like that. Our program, you know, before we can, you know, fix this, what's going on in the head so they can think straight to actually be in class, um, we have to fix this, our heart. We don't know what's going on within their household. We don't know what tra tra tragedies um, they've been going through. Um, you know, a lot of single parent households um, or both parents working, you know, endless jobs because of low, well, because a lot of them don't make enough money, don't have a living for them. And they just decide, you know, all of this is going on. Why am I going to school? I should be helping them. It's a survival mode for each one of these kids. So they don't have time to be thinking, oh, yeah, I belong in this school building. Um, no, I belong in the street sometimes because they hear it. They hear it within sometimes society telling them, oh, yeah, because you look like this, you should be um, on the streets already. Or, you know, sometimes we hear it from, unfortunately, our, or, the, or the big guys, you know, calling them rapists or um committing crimes. So they think that they think they believe that they are this person, but they're not. That's why at, at, with having advocates, we, we monitor these kids. Um, we motivate them. We bring a sense back to, no, you know, you know what? I really think that you have the potential. You're not this label that people have created. You're, you're another person you belong, you know, and then once they, they gain that trust in you, you know, everything changes. Their value of learning comes in. That's when we see the observable, like we would say. You know, we start looking at kids that are engaging now in class. Okay, what are my interests? What do I want to do? Um, I'm actually pretty good at football. Okay, let's do football. Let's do some tryouts. Um, as advocates, we motivate them to continue doing something different. Maybe they may not see it in school. Sometimes they're involved in the justice system and, you know, they don't see potential in them. Or sometimes even school fails them, unfortunately. But as long as that they, ha as long as they have somebody there, everything is going to change for them. We're not going to see a change within two months. Oh yeah, you're working with somebody. You should be different. No, change doesn't happen overnight. Change happens within six, maybe a year, maybe two years. It takes time. With. And overall, with our, um, we use three, three strategies overall in our case management. We do case management. Everything is individualized because every child is different. Um, our student engagement, um, which we cultivate their leadership and their development. And overall, we do parent engagement. Um, first of all, with our case management, since we are based in school, um, we do interventions on a daily basis. Um, obviously, Monday to Friday um, when we're in class because <laughs> we do need that time of our own because um, it, it, it's a hard job because we, we go through different emotions every single day because they're young, you know, they're young adults, they're kids. They're still getting into that mode of what, what do I do? Where do I belong? Um, so these interventions can go from starting in the hallway to maybe the library or the conference room. Um, these interventions can happen anywhere, um, even over phone calls sometimes. Um, so interventions, we work with kids. Um, we come up with game plans, a lot of um, goals, short goals. Yes, we want to focus on long term, um, but short terms are the short term goals are always the easiest to complete um, and to get to um, to give them hope because that's what we want to give them back the hope of them being, you know, someone in life and getting their education overall. Um, within our resources that Ms. Carmen mentioned, we try to eliminate some type of barrier. Obviously, we can change um, the world, but we try to remove some barriers with resources that we, we may be able to give or the school may be, be able to give or the community itself. Um, so that would be some, some portions of our... Um, our case management side. Well, how do we engage them overall? These are kids, right? They like to have fun. 
Um, so we come up with different things, you know, we have our, um, our food days. So every month we, you know, we bring up different topics, um, that we like to discuss and just go over with food, you know, who doesn't love food, especially kids don't like cafeteria food, let's be honest. Um, so, you know, if it's canes, it is, um, so it's, it's, it's amazing because a lot of them collaborate within each other and give each other a lot of feedback and like, hey, you need to do this or you need to do that. It's just amazing what you see in these kids. Um, we do a lot of community engagement activities, um, which Mr. Mr. Mahatma Largaspada would be going over in our sequel piece, but we are also included in those community activities. Um, and overall, we have a healthy challenge. Um, attendance cup within our seven dis- our seven schools. Um, we actually give a little bonus to the kids. So if you know, if Brian beats Sal, then we get an additional. And you know, if it's in our budget, we get a little bit of money, and we either get some good, really good ice cream, some sundays, or you know, maybe it's just a gift card. It just it just depends. <laughs> um, our student engagement, also leadership development. Um, like I mentioned, we are year round. So many of our kids um, are enrolled or ready and pumps because they want to do some field trips, some summer workshops. You can go from an art workshop to zip lining. Um, we like to expose our kids to what's out there and what's available. Um, we even have many field trips. Many of our kids aren't able to go to, aren't able to go to a lot of you know college visits because. Um, maybe they don't have the best attendance or their GPA is not there. So they're not as exposed um, but as our organization and our program. Um, we believe every child has an option, has that abil- the ability to go to college. You know, if it is college, you know, right, well, community college or university or even a trade school, we want to expose them. So we um, decide to do many field trips within those areas so they can see that it is available to them. Um, Family and youth resources. um, Many of those resources are within our organization with our family community bill being and our ABE program Um, and family nights. A lot of our family nights are just getting together with our families. All of our families don't have time to get together or spend time because, you know, work scheduling, um, a lot of issues within the household budgets, so we decide to go ahead and, you know, let's do a bowling night or let's do a harvest festival. It just depends. Um, as long as we collaborate together, um, they just have to enjoy themselves. And it's a, some good time overall. And finally, we have our um, parental engagement. Um, luckily, we do have um, an amazing team and we also have a family strengthening coach. So our family strengthening coach um, collaborates with our student advocates to work with our families since we are the majority of the time within the school building and working with the children. Um, our family strengthening coach collaborates with our parents, you know, calls them, hey, you know, are, how are you guys doing? You know, how can we help you? You know, is there anything else going on in the household um, that we can, you know, do some wraparound services? Um, and that's something that is a plus for us because sometimes, you know, with either making phone calls to home or, you know, working with the student, it's a lot. And luckily we have somebody working with us in that position that can help us. Um, And our family strengthening coach is also our Cara Corazon facilitator. Uh, And I believe I think that's it for me. I will go ahead and pass it over to Mr. Mahatma Largaspada. He did want me to give him some beats so he can be, (laughs) so he can get some energy and be ready for you guys. But I appreciate you guys taking the time. I hope you guys are enjoying a salad or some chicken. Um, hopefully we go to lunch after this. <laughs> Any questions on the Pathways to Success piece so far? Yeah, there are a couple. Um, Can we hear have, them? Whoops, sorry. Do you have a hard time locating funding for food? We know it brings kids, but many times funding does not allow for food. Any ideas? So that is always a challenge. Um, But one of the things, I mean, we try to find affordable options for us. And though sometimes, you know, it could be, so one, it is a challenge. 
And two, we have to be creative. We have to think outside of the box. Um, so we do have our budgets and we do try to stay by it. Um, there have been times and opportunities where it's like, okay, you can bring your school lunch and then we'll give you a couple slices of the pizza. Um, we have been very lucky and blessed to work with different South Omaha businesses um, that will allow us, you know, they'll throw in extra food uh, whenever we have our, um, our activities, whether it's our family nights or or when it's our lunch and learn activities, you know, and we also either give them a shout out on social media or we pass out their business cards. Um, so that's how we have been able to manage the food situation. But we are right with you when it comes to um, asking <coughs> for um, for money for food. So if you're actually watching this presentation, whether it is now or after, and you're um someone who's going to be willing to invest in programming like ours and everybody else who's watching, you know, that's something that we should think about, you know, food brings people together and food helps in building community. So maybe that's something that we should also look into. So. Um, Any other questions? Deb? Yeah. A couple more. Do you have good participation in family night? Mm -hmm. So, um, if you don't mind, um, Keep in mind that uh, our family nights, uh, we, we would have them every other month um, and it would be different things. Uh, we go to different locations and bring families and the youth together. Uh, participation was always successful pre-COVID. Um, after COVID, and I'll talk a little bit about it um, here in a minute, uh, you know, we had to tweak and rethink how to better serve our families of uh, family nights and that time of gathering, bringing food and going or taking families bowling and doing something fun uh, kind of had to take a bit of a step back so that we could concentrate on what families truly needed, uh, especially right now. Uh, but pre-COVID, uh, it was very successful, yes. uh, especially our, our Christmas family nights. Uh, families would always gather or our end of the year. Uh, I can't remember what we called them. End of the year bash, you know, just depends. There was a variety. Either we do like our holiday party um, or we had a family gathering in the summer. Um, I think the last time was, you know, going to, I think it was Lake Manawa, right? Yep. We, you know, paid for their entrance to go to the beach and um, everybody, you know, brought in, obviously it was pre-COVID, um, everybody brought a dish and it was just like a huge B2S family. Yep. Um, it was amazing. Yep. Um, one thing that I want to point out that helps us in this area, because I know a lot of times uh, for organizations that work with youth, uh, keeping the parents engaged, it's, it's a challenge. Um, and, and, you know, we're, we're not trying to say that for us, that, oh, it's, it's easy, we get them to go. No, uh, it takes a lot of communication. Um, might I just mention uh, that we have a, a, a family training coach that works in conjunction with the student advocates. Uh, while the student advocates are concentrating on the students, on academics, uh, the family training coach concentrates on working with uh, the, the families and the parents, constant communication, sending messages, reminders. Um, it's it's, it's a full-time position that we have out here at the center because we know that to be able to keep the parents engaged, uh, you also have to develop that relationship the same as we do with, uh, with the youth. Um, and having uh, Leticia Chrisman is, is the name of our uh, family learning coach and having her um, on board with us, collaborating with the advocates and facilitator uh, makes a huge difference because they have that one um, person that's always making sure that the parents are, uh, you know, aware of what's going on, uh, keep, keep in, uh, kept in the loop as to what events or what activities we're doing with the kids. Um, but that's something that has made a huge, huge difference uh, for our parental engagement. Great. Um, there was one comment. It's not really a question. This is from Jerry. He said, great points. Number one, gaining trust. Number two, motivating with short-term goals and fun. Number three, being patient and not expecting change overnight, seeing their hearts. So I wanted you guys to yes. see that. <laughs> yes, uh, that's something that's uh, um, it's part of the curriculum, the Check and Connect curriculum. It's very, very specific, and it's something that we're always keeping in mind. Uh, the curriculum always uh, it, it mentions that for us to be able to see positive changes in the youth that we work with, it, it would take, and I think Maida mentioned that between six months to a year to a year and a half. 
Um, but it's a matter of um, investing time in working with the youth, being there, being consistent. And I'll, I'll come back to this consistency part um, here in a minute. Um, but yes, it's, uh, it, it's a process, you know, kids and Carmen mentioned this uh, yesterday when we were going through this PowerPoint, uh, disengagement, it's something that doesn't happen, you know, from one day to the next. Kids that are disengaged, it's, it's been a process, you know, it's been months, maybe years uh, for them to, to become disengaged from school or uh, from their families, from themselves. With that awareness, we also understand that re-engaging this youth also takes time. You know, it's not something that we're going to do in one, two, three meetings. Uh, you know, it, it, it takes a while, but it's that consistency and that uh, genuine relationship uh, that makes the difference. That's there are all the no... questions for now, so. Awesome. <laughs> then I'll continue on with my little part. <clears throat> so... Uh, like I mentioned at the beginning, my name is uh, Mahatma Larga Espada, and I am the supervisor for our Talking Circles uh, program. Um, before uh, we start talking about how we can impact behavior through culture, uh, we have to understand that cultural teachings, values, ceremonies uh, can help a person recenter uh, himself or herself. Uh, but we also have to agree that culture has value, that there is something tangible and measurable about uh, going back to your cultural teachings that can have a positive effect on, on, on families and youth. Um, in our Talking Circles programs, uh, we have three different groups. Uh, we have uh, Olin, uh, which is our young men's group. We have Sochikali, which is our young ladies group. And we have Caray Corazon, which translated will be face and heart. Uh, and that is our parental engagement uh, circle. Or circle. Um, for Olin and Sochikali, the young men and young ladies group, we use the same model, which is called Joven Noble or Noble Youth. Uh, these are evidence-based curriculums that were created um, by Jerry Teo. He is a member of the National Compadres Network, uh, which is a national organization based out of California. Um, if at the end of the presentation or during you want more information on this organization, we'll be more than happy to, to connect you with them. Um, but these are the, the curriculums that will be followed. Care Corazon uh, has its own uh, curriculum, uh, which is uh, specific targeting or addressing parents' uh, parental needs. Uh, for Sochikali, which is our young ladies group, um, by the way, Olin and Sochikali, uh, since we use the same curriculum, uh, everything that I mentioned for these two groups applies for, for both. Uh, but Olin uh, uh, and Sochikali, they're both based on the philosophy and the understanding that youth need family, men, women, the community to be able to grow and to be able to develop and transition into those rites of passage that will lead them into understanding and learning what true uh, manhood and womanhood is. Um, and you may be asking right now, well, what does that mean? Uh, if you ask me, uh, I would tell you, I don't know, I'm still working on it. Uh, what we try to teach our kids is that becoming a, a, a man or a woman of credible word, a uh, man or woman of palabra, um, it's a process. You know, it's not something that you achieve when you become 18. It's not something that you achieve when you turn 21. Uh, being a better man, a better woman, somebody that will be uh, a productive community member, um, it's a lifelong learning process. And what we try to teach them is that they had to fight for that every single day. Um, we try to teach them what it means to, to care for community, to be able to appreciate family, which are things that have been maybe not lost uh, in, in our families today, but there is a, um, a disconnection. Um, throughout the years here at the, at the center, uh, and mind you, I've only been here at the center for six years. I don't want to sound like I've been here for like 14. Or, uh, but throughout the years in working with youth, uh, what we've seen is that uh, kids, are, kids are suffering and they're struggling because they have lo lost that sense of self. They have lost their, their identity. Um, and what we try to do in our Talking Circles groups, um, including Olin, which is our young men's group, uh, is that we want them to, we want to teach the youth to think for themselves through cultural values. Um, 
we want them to understand that it is okay to question things. Um, our youth have been told to be a certain way, to dress a certain way, to speak a certain way, to not go to certain places. Um, even in some of the sessions that we, uh, when we talk about who you are and your identity, um, a lot of them, uh, and keep in mind, these are kids uh, that are born here. Uh, they don't con consider themselves American because they have been told that they're not. You know, and that shows you that there's a disconnection with uh, within this youth, uh, and they're lacking that sense of of belonging. You know, they they may be in our communities, they may be in our schools, but within themselves, there's still that little voice that says, "Oh, you don't belong. You're not like everybody else." And what we try to do here um, is just to get them to think. Um, at no point in no session we try to influence youth. Uh, all that we want to do, like Maida said, uh, we want him to think uh, here and here. I don't know if you can see me, but I'm touching my head and my heart. We want him to think in both places so they're able to grow and develop and really understand who, who they are. We, we try to teach him that culture, uh, the cultural knowledge provides a, um, a starting point for them, a place to, to look back for guidance. Uh, culture gives them um, you know, teachings for living uh, culture instills pride in them. Um, a lot of our youth um, or some of the youth that we work with, um, when we talk about culture and being proud of the color of your skin, uh, the accent that you may have, like me, uh, you know, all these little things that they should be proud of, uh, they're actually ashamed of. Um, I ha I've had youth in my, in my group that they don't like their name. You know, they... I, can remember this particular kid uh his name was marcos and when i first met him he said no no no, don't call me marcos call me marcus you know i don't want people to know that i'm not from here you know and that shows you that that sense of disconnection that sense of oh, i'm not like everybody else i i shouldn't be here um and those are the ideas that we want to um our youth our young men young ladies to be able to uh work through and to to question Uh, for Care Corazon, um, like I mentioned, they have their own curriculum, their own teachings. Um, I want to emphasize that Care Corazon is not parenting classes at all. Uh, one thing that we understand here is that parents already know how to be parents. Uh, they may have struggles, you know, different issues, uh, but parents already know how to be parents. And the family already has the, the tools needed that will provide those uh, resiliency factors that will that's able to bring the family back together. What we try to do in Cara Corazon is to help parents understand that there is a disconnection between parent and child when the parent is born outside of the States or raised in a different culture um, in comparison to what the kids go through or what the kids learn uh, by being born here. Uh, there is a separation. There is a, um, a, a loss of communication. In, in Care Corazon, um, with the help of the facilitator, which is Leticia Chrisman, and you can see her here in the picture in the middle, um, what she does is she, she leads a conversation. She opens up the, uh, the space. She keeps it as, as sacred and safe so our parents can help each other out. Uh, we don't have all the answers. But a lot of times dealing or talking about those, those gifts and baggages, those, those cargas and those regalos that we always mention, um, and leaving them here in this space uh, makes a huge difference. Um, our talking circles, they're not therapy by any means, uh, but they're therapeutic in nature. Um, so our main hope for the Cara Corazon program is for parents to be able to support each other. Uh, we do have Leticia, you know, she's the facilitator. Uh, but at the end of the day, we want parents to be able to rely on each other because they already have those tools. It's just a matter of bringing, it up, bringing them up to, to the floor and discussing those issues and talking about them. Any questions so far regarding our talking circles? Um, none on talking circles yet. There is a question that goes back to the agricultural internship to know uh, if, um, if it's funded by grants. 
Yes, so there is some private funding. Um, we don't lead that program, so I wouldn't be able to give you much detail about it. But yes, there is some um, some grants that do fund that program. Um, if you want to drop your email, or actually, um, if you go to our site, find my email, email me directly, and I can connect you to the person who would be able to give you more information regarding that. Um, then, um, let me see, there's one question on the Compadres Network. Is it the same? Yes, Shelly was the one who put in a, a link to the National Compadres Network .org, um, And she asked, is it the same evidence-based programming under Compadres Network? Yes, it is. Okay. Yes, they have, uh, just FYI, they have multiple curriculums. Um, here at the center, I believe we have three of them. Uh, we have a curriculum for uh, called Shinashli, which is used to in working uh, for with young ladies. Uh, like I mentioned, we have Hoven Noble or Noble Youth, which is for young men, and we have Kare Corazon. But yes, all curriculums are uh, from the National Compatriots Network. Um, what concerns come up in talking circles? regarding the Latinx culture. Uh, can you repeat the question? It cut off there for a minute. Yep, sorry. What common concerns come up in talking circles regarding the Latinx culture? Um, there are many. Um, for in, And I can mostly speak about the young men. That's the, uh, the group that I facilitate. Um, but for them... Um, Right now, kids are worried about many, many things. Uh, they are struggling with not having any food. Uh, they are worried about not being able to make it in school. A lot of them, uh, when everything went uh, online, um, they started struggling. Even those students that were doing well in school, they started struggling when they went online because it wasn't something that they're, that they're used to. Um, of course, and I don't want to get into politics, um, but youth are especially in the past four years, uh, youth were far more concerned about the language that was being used to describe them, uh, the language that was being used in talking about people that look like them, how people that look like them were being treated uh, by those in higher positions. Uh, so there's a lot of, of concerns uh, for our Hispanic Latino uh, youth uh, but at the same time, uh, this is a, this was a time where I was able to see them even more involved and in that they were able to um, ask more questions, or get more more interested in, you know, why are these things happening, which allowed us in our in our talking circles to be able to bring sessions regarding, you know, well, let's learn about the history. You know, this isn't the first time that things like this are happening. This isn't the first time that uh people that look like you are called this or are seen as this, you know, it, it provided a lot of uh, uh, good, uh, good communication, good talks uh, in some of our, our session, but uh, the, the concerns are, are many right now, like I mentioned, the just basic needs are, are a huge concern and, and they're always in, in their mind. Um. Maybe you have touched on this already, but what has your thought on the importance of being in person with youth still? Oh, I'll, I'll get to this here in a minute. And thank you for the question. Is there any other questions? Um, with decision makers viewing this presentation, what do you want them to know about your culture? <laughs> what do I want them to know about our culture? A, it's a big question. Um, the one thing, if if you ask me, what do I want people to know about our culture? I just want you guys to know, whoever whoever's asking. Uh, first of all, thank you. Uh, the reason we are here, it is not because we want to take anybody's job. We don't want to bring problems to anyone we don't want to uh you know 
cause harm in any way. The reason we are here is because we have to, and we've always been, you know, we, just like everybody else, we're just trying to make it. We just want to live. We just want to be um, able to have the, you know, the happiness that everybody is looking for and be able to be successful, whatever uh, uh, that may look is different for everyone. Um, but our youth, um, our parents, um, we are struggling. And a lot of times that struggle, uh, it's, it seem as, you know, oh, maybe they're not trying hard enough or why aren't they doing this or why aren't they getting better jobs? You know, there is a constant uh, struggle within our culture because uh, there's always been that, that idea of that, uh, talk of, you know, you guys don't belong here. Like I mentioned, you know, our kids themselves don't consider themselves American, which is completely wrong. We belong here. We've always been here. And there is no reason for anybody, no matter what your position is, to be able to, to, to say, oh, no, you, you don't belong here. You're not like us. You know, you go back to whatever country, speak American, you know, which are things sadly that our kids hear all the time. You know, those things are wrong. They're just, they make no sense. Um, but the reason we're here, what I wanted to know is that we're just here trying to survive like everybody else. You know, we're trying to do the best that we can. Um, we're not here to cause harm. We're here to be as productive as, as anybody can and try to find that, you know, like I said, that happiness and that success that everybody else is, is looking for. If you were to ask me in addition um, or to go off of Mahatma, um, when we talk about our culture, our culture is beautiful. Mm -hmm. you no, know, we embrace it. And we want to be able to pay it forward with the youth and the families that we work with so that they can also embrace it and they can be proud of it. Um, family is important to us. And I'm not speaking on traditional family, you know, family, extended family for us. You don't have to be related through blood to be family, you know, and we consider some of our families and sometimes they consider us Though we put and we set healthy boundaries with them. Um, but all of you service providers that work in this field know that, you know, we consider them families. They consider us family because they receive that unconditional support. Um, and also with our culture and with many other cultures, um, quality over quality we value relationships you know we're not just a number and though it's hard when it comes to funding but um you know sometimes no negative change if it's a steady change with the um people that we work with that's a success and sometimes that's something that you know we have this mindset of like numbers numbers funding or money you know uh, which is important but also we have to take a look into the quality of change that we're also um, making and the relationships that we're building, you know, the reason why we do our job. And when we talk about our culture and the culture that we want to have here within our pathways to success program is, you know, one day I want to, I know that I'm not going to be doing this forever. I love my job, but I want to see the students, the youth, the parents that I work with, you know, be in my place, take my spot, take my job and do the same. Um, this is one thing that we all, always share, you know, the job that we're doing, we shouldn't be doing it. You know, we do it because there's members in the community that don't step up to be that positive role model, you know, for many various different reasons and challenges that families go through. The youth don't have the positive role models, um, you know, that consistent support from many other people. So there has to be positions like ours. You know, we have to provide that and we get paid for it. Again, we're lucky and we're blessed that we get paid for it. But let's be honest, our positions and our job shouldn't be something that we should get paid for. That's something that we as a community should be able to step up and be able to provide that support without being paid for, for our younger generations that will then um, take care of us when we're older. But I went a little bit on a rant. I'll come back to the presentation. Um, but know that everything that we say, um, 
you know, comes from a good place and, and has the best intentions. Uh, so um, I'll hand it over to Mahatma if there's no more questions, Deb, so that way you can get to learn more about the things that we changed. And this will answer the question about doing in-person services and virtual services, um, because we do and we did how to change our services. Actually, it's about to be a year next month when we started, um, you know, doing our changes of going virtual and working uh, from home. So... And uh, just one more thing to always keep in mind um, that indigenous peoples and, you know, we were people that have come from trauma. Um, historically, uh, there's been a lot of trauma um, in, in our history, in our um, upbringing. Um, in a cultural understanding of the historical trauma we carry, um, it's key in uh, beginning the healing process that can lead to positive changes in our youth and our families. So always keep that in mind, you know, if sometimes we, uh, we don't do X or Y, which, you know, you know, some people might say, oh, why don't you just do this? And then you'll be fine. Um, because we're always dealing with trauma. You know, it's always in our mind. It's, it's, it's always with it, uh, with us. Um, it, imagine being, having that fight or flight uh, uh, mindset, 24 seven and not being able to, to understand where it's coming from, uh, why you feel that way, uh, growing up uh, or alone, confused or without the capacity to being, uh, to be in the moment. Um, it's difficult. And a lot of other things that we should, or that, you know, youth, um, some people say should be doing, uh, takes, takes, uh, um, a backseat, you know, because they're trying to deal with all these things, depression, anxiety, uh, loneliness, a lack of purpose. Uh, that's a huge one with the, with the youth that, that we work with. Um, so always keep those things in mind. Um, we're just trying to help out our, the youth the best that we can. But like I mentioned, even with the check and connect uh, model, it's a process and it takes time. You know, these kids have heard all this negative uh, rhetoric for so long. And now we're trying to change that through culture by going back to where they came from and those uh, cultural teachings that their family had. And, you know, it, it takes time, but that's what we're trying to do. Yeah. Well, we do have one more question, but I know I, we've only got about five or four minutes left now. Do you have another portion that still needs to be presented, Mahatma? Yes, I do. Um, let me go very quickly through these and then we'll see how, if we have time for questions. Um, so some of the things that we did in our program when the pandemic uh, hit, uh, we, like I said, we started addressing family needs instead of working, uh, concentrating on family nights. And here in some of these images, you can see that in collaboration with some of the other programs at the center, uh, we've uh, concentrated on providing uh, those basic services, families providing food, cleaning supplies, uh, masks, everything that we could to help out the families, including uh, financial assistant, uh, assistance here through the, through the center. Um, the LCM, I think Carmen or might have mentioned this, uh, the LCM is open to any youth uh, that is enrolled in any of our youth programming, and they're able to come here to the center and pro uh, be provided with uh, tutoring and homework help. Uh, they're able to be here as early as 7.30, four days a week, and they can leave at, by 3.30 or 4. Um, uh, we've also... Uh, made our groups smaller. Uh, Pre-COVID, um, I had a group of about 20 young men in my uh, Olin group. Um, but one thing that we decided to do is just to split the groups into two. So we're still, each individual circle is still serving about 20 members. Uh, we just split them into two and we meet every other week uh, with the different groups. Um, something else that we did is that we tried to do activities uh, that involves the youth in in the community that instills that sense of pride in community. Uh, and you can see in the first image, uh, in collaboration with the city of Omaha, we've gone uh, graf done graffiti cleanup. Uh, we picked up trash down 24th Street. Uh, we've given out uh, face masks. I believe that last time we did, we gave away face masks to people in the community. Uh, we give out we gave away three thousand face masks in about forty five minutes. So, and it was really good for the youth because they felt proud of doing something that was uh, serving somebody else. Um, I want to get to these three very, very quickly. Uh, 
one thing that we wanted to address is what challenges our youth face when they enter the system. And I want to uh, emphasize that these are three things, uh, three topics that the youth themselves brought up. Uh, they mentioned that there is a lack of communication between the youth, the family, and the system. There is no follow through and consistency, and that there is a huge difficulty in navigating an already confusing system. Um, when it comes to our youth, uh, some things that they mention are that when you know they end up in diversion, probation, or some some program because of some uh, mistake that they may have uh, made, uh, there is communication at the very beginning of their participation or, or them entering the system, but then afterwards there's nothing. Uh, we've had youth that call me um, asking what their next court date is uh, because they don't know. Um, parents, uh, I've gone to parents to um, meet with them at the courts because nobody else is there with them. Uh, I've, I've driven all the way to Fremont to meet with the family uh, that was involved in the system. Um, and it was a whole confusion. They were supposed to be in Douglas. Nobody communicated with anybody. It, you know, there's a lot of cha challenges. And then with youth, uh, they're having a hard time understanding the importance of completing either diversion or probation because of the lack of follow through. And this is what they told me. If they don't care, why should I? And this is something that we were, uh, I think Carmen mentioned, that consistency is what we um, need to provide us as uh, agencies that work with youth or with families. Um, it is hard. It is hard to work with families. It is hard to have the time. Uh, and we here, Carmen, Maida, and I, were blessed enough that, you know, we get paid to, to do this job. Uh, but this is something that we should all be doing. Tra in traditional communities, uh, um, it, it was a community uh wide event to be able to to help raise children to be able to educate children it wasn't something that was isolated just to a particular family uh, and that's something that we've we've forgotten we've we've lost that um, but here in our circles you know that's what we wanted we wanted to be a community uh, we all help help each other out uh, we know that uh, it takes time but we try to be as consistent as possible with the youth we try to be there as much as possible so that they know that we are here because we care and not because this is a job or something that we have to do. No, we care about them and we want them to, to be successful. The difficulty is navigating the system. Um, a lot of it comes from uh, a lack of uh, Spanish speaking services for parents. Um, you know, they, we have difficulty navigating the system sometimes and understanding why some decisions are made. Uh, imagine how much more so um, a parent that, uh, you know, may not be able to communicate or that uses their, their child to be able to understand what's, what's happening. Um, but these are some of the things that the youth mentioned. Um, and that's all I have. The final slides are just some stats regarding our program, which I think we shared those. Uh, but if anybody wants to see these a little bit more closely, let us know. We'll be able to, to share those. Thank you so much. There's a lot of good information there. I believe that we're going to have the survey coming up while Rodney is making the closing uh, remarks. Hello, everyone. Hello. Uh, my name is Rodney Evans. I am the uh, other co-chair co working with LaDonna. In closing, I just wanted to uplift and thank Carmen and her team over at the Latino Center of the Midlands for their insight and experience and the great work that they are doing. As we come to close, there will be a five question survey that will pop up momentarily. Please take a minute to answer the survey as your feedback will assist us to improve our efforts in this work of RED. With today's climate and racial divide, it is at this time and at this moment that we do not buckle to the injustices and unfair practices that have plagued our communities for years. Although some of our conversations may be difficult, they are conversations that are necessary and needed to move this work of equality and justice for all. Again, Thank you for your, your time today. And if you haven't downloaded the NJJ app for next month's training session, please do so. We will feature our very own Reddit coordinator, Mr. Ajamal Binden. This session will take place February 24th at noon. Please check the NJJ website for any changes and or updates. Thank you.